Stay it's long. And I think that you can stay seated because you might hear it better. Um, just let the words of this gospel lesson just wash over you this morning. It's found in the Gospel of Luke on page 851 in your pew Bibles. <clears throat> it begins with chapter 16, verse 1. Then Jesus said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management, because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then the manager said to himself, what will I do now that my master is taking the position away from me? I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do so that when I am dismissed as manager, people may welcome me into their homes. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, How much do you owe my master? He answered, A hundred jugs of olive oil. He said to him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it fifty. Then he asked another, and how much do you owe? He replied, a hundred containers of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and make it 80. And his master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, Make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. Whatever is faithful, whoever is faithful in very little, is faithful also in much. And whoever is dishonest in very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters. For a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Grace and peace to you from a generous God who gives us all that we need and makes us managers of all that we have. Such a curious parable today. If you find yourselves scratching your head in perplexity by what you have just heard, you are not alone because I have been scratching my head all week. Now, proof of the weirdness of this parable is that it comes down to us over time with a couple of different titles. Luke 16 is known both as the parable of the dishonest steward and the parable of the shrewd manager. Can it be both? If the conflicting titles of the parable seems confusing, the parable itself appears to be almost a riddle, one of the most debated passages in the New Testament. So what can this parable mean? Well, here's the parable again in a nutshell. A rich landowner tells his unsatisfactory manager that he's going to fire him. Now, we don't know how long the employee had to clean out his desk, but apparently it was long enough to win friends and influence the people who had accounts with his boss. The manager called in these people and reduced their debt. And when the boss heard about it, for some reason the boss did not call in the lawyer, but sat back and even laughed in admiration. Now how can Jesus tell a story where the main character, the applauded character, is a crook. How come this manager would be commended 
by his boss. Well, maybe this story will help expand our understanding. You've all heard about Henry Ford, the inventor of the automobile. Well, there are many stories that have been written about him, how he was one of the world's richest men in the day, but frugal in his personal life, to the point of appearing cheap. Many of his personal effects are still on permanent display in the Ford Museum. His pen, his knife, his comb, all cheap, even in his day. This stuff was the least expensive. For example, his 10-cent pocket knife was the bargain basement special even in the 1930s. Now, why would a man who has everything, or can have everything, be so frugal? When asked, his answer was twofold. First, he said that's exactly how he was able to create such a vast automobile empire in the beginning. He saw himself as a merchant and not as a consumer. And secondly, Mr. Ford wanted to live as inexpensively as he could so that he could maximize his generosity to others. And his philanthropy is legendary. Dr. John Bertrand, one of his personal secretaries, tells the following story. Ford was visiting his family's ancestral village in Ireland when two trustees of the local hospital came and talked with him. And they talked Ford into giving the hospital $5,000. Now, this was in the 1930s, and so $5,000 was a great deal of money. Well, the next morning at breakfast, Ford opened his daily newspaper to read the banner headline, American Millionaire Gives $50,000 to Local Hospital. Well, Ford wasted no time in summoning these two hospital trustees, flashing the paper in their face and says, explain this. Well, they apologized profusely. Dreadful error, sir. And they promised to get the editor of the paper to print a retraction the very next day, declaring that the great Henry Ford had not given 50,000, but only five. Hearing this, Ford offered them another 45000 under one condition, that the trustees would erect a marble arch in the new hospital entrance and place upon it a plaque that read, I walked among you and you took me in. Now the shrewdness of these two trustees reminds me very much of the steward in today's gospel. They took an opportunity that was presented to them and used it to the best advantage. They used the supposed error in the newspaper headline to put Henry Ford in a position that he did not want to look like a cheapskate. So their quick thinking brought in a considerable amount of extra income for the hospital. Well, this brings me back to the steward in our parable today. Now, I can't claim with full confidence to know exactly why the rich landowner commends this dishonest manager. But it does occur to me that one of the most prominent themes in Luke is the proper use of wealth. Except that it's not necessarily the use of wealth. It's more like Luke is concerned with our relationship to wealth and how that affects our relationships with others. With this in mind, we sense a profound change in the rather interesting, if not terribly admirable, character of the dishonest manager. For while he once acted in a dishonest way to enrich himself, he now acts to enrich others and thereby establish a relationship of mutual benefit. Now granted, he does this out of a sense of desperation, And granted, he's still acting in a rather fishy way, given that he's cutting the debts that are owed to his boss, 
and not him. But he has caught on to the fact that money can be used to kindle relationships, even if it's relationships of mutual obligation. And so, perhaps the manager commends him for just this shrewdness, that in a moment of desperation, he is able to use his financial savvy to make friends rather than enemies. Now, whatever we might think of the manager, might we recognize that there are better and worse ways to use money? And using money to establish relationships is better than hoarding it. And more to the point, might we use this parable as a chance to talk about money and to talk about our relationships to money and our use of money? And maybe some of you have started to squirm for your seats and maybe look for exit doors as the pastor brings up money. There is a strong cultural taboo about talking about money with others, isn't there? I remember when I was young and I asked my dad how much money he made. He told me it was none of my business. So later when I was negotiating my very first job and my dad asked me what I would be paid, I responded, it's none of your business. <laughs> now, that response to my father was really bratty. But it was clear that I had also caught on to this cultural taboo. Money is a taboo to talk about. Yet, most people I know, including myself, struggle to make sense of our economic lives and would welcome some counsel. And I think that's part of what this parable indeed speaks to. The struggle to make good use of our resources. How much is enough? How much should we give away? How can we raise children who are both wise and generous? Well, I'm not sure if this parable gives clear guidance to any of these questions, it does present characters who also struggle with money, characters with mixed motives and yet who change over time in relationship to their circumstances, characters perhaps not unlike ourselves. And while talking about money has become taboo, Jesus talks about it all the time. Scripture is riddled with messages about wealth, and while there is no simple economic view about economics, there are a few themes that seem to run across the Gospels and make their appearance in today's story. And one of them is that wealth is both a blessing and a responsibility. We are blessed to be a blessing, and we are held accountable less for what resources we have accumulated than how we use them. From this point of view, perhaps the shrewdness or prudence of the manager comes through his recognition that he is privileged, he has privileged amassing wealth to developing relationships. Another theme that runs through this is that wealth along with status, power, and privilege, is fleeting. One day this manager is on the top of the world, and the next day he is faced with disaster. And I'm not sure if we are so far removed. If we look back at 2008 and we see the financial meltdown, we cannot help but remember how many people lost so much of what they had amassed in such a short amount of time. And as I visit with people in the hospital, I'm made very aware how an emergency, a medical emergency, can devastate the finances of a family so quickly. When faced with the pronouncement that we cannot serve God and wealth, we might remember that Whereas the Lord's attention and care are constant, wealth proves to be a pretty fickle and ultimately untrustworthy master. 
And the third theme is that in times of crisis, God often appears where we least expect God to be, coming up to us from below to render help and aid. We hear a lot of stories of crisis in Luke. And the help always comes from unexpected places. The Jewish traveler left for dead along the road who is saved by a Samaritan. The rich man who begs for help from Lazarus, the slave he ignored. To today's manager, now suddenly dependent on those who used to look to him for loans. Throughout scripture, from Mary's Magnificat through the Beatitudes to Jesus' death on the cross, God regularly shows up in those places where we least expect God to be. And maybe this is so that we are not tempted to place our faith in the wrong place. And perhaps that is the key, or at least one of the keys to this story today. We are placed on this earth to love and care for each other, not to separate ourselves from each other with wealth, status, and privilege. I have heard it said that St. Augustine asserted that God gave us people to love and things to use. And yet sin has confused this in our lives and switched it from loving things and using people. So friends, let's see this weird parable as an invitation to talk about those things that are hard to talk about, to ask ourselves questions about our own wealth, especially as a community that is wealthy in so many ways. Questions like what is our responsibility to those with less? How might we use the money we have to build relationships? What might our congregation look like if we continue to be a place where we can help each other think more clearly about our economic lives in light of our faith? And how do we help each other use the money well without ultimately serving it? Most likely we will find that it is not in the answers that the importance and the meaning is found, but rather that we are asking and wrestling with the questions together where the meaning is. And as we wrestle with these questions, let's take seriously that God gives us people to love, that we are given all of our resources to care for others, and that none of us know how much time we may have to do that. So let us look around and see those people all around us and see them as God's true gifts to us. The honest wealth and the true riches of our life live together in community. Thanks be to God. Amen.